Julie Hottinger, Jana Hottinger, sisters, welcome to Acquiring Minds. We're glad to be here. Yes. Julie and Jana, I've already said one interesting angle to your story. You are sisters, but there's a lot more. The two of you bought a business in the construction space last year. Last year or was it earlier this year? Uh, earlier this year, October. No, October of 2023. Yeah. The two of you bought a business in the construction space last year. And despite some hiccups, it is going well. So we want to hear all about it. Julie, why don't you start us off with some background on yourself? Then Jana, we'll go to you. I started off working in politics. And then when I had my uh, first and only kid, I um, transitioned into public health, um, went back to school, got my master's and PhD, and worked in public health for about 10 years through COVID. And I've always been interested in sort of doing something um, you know, running my own business, but I had always thought that you had to like come up with an idea or something. So I sort of had been thinking about incorporating what I was doing into somehow creating a business. But then um, I started getting like tired of public health. COVID really kind of put me through the ringer, I guess. Um, and didn't really like, I don't love working in a bureaucracy. Um, I found that out during my public health career. And I, my best friend's husband had um, purchased a, about 10 years ago, he bought a carpet cleaning business and made it, grew it really big and ended up selling it off. And I started talking to him about um, starting a business and getting out of public health and doing my own thing. Um, meanwhile, Jana and I are sort of talking about doing this, and I'll let uh, her tell you her story. But we um, started looking at starting our own business and looked into um, things that we could easily learn without having to go back to school. And then like six months through that, um, he was like, why don't you just buy a business? And so we uh, bought the book, Buy Then Build, started listening to your podcast. And a year and a half later, we uh, bought a business. Amazing. And yeah. just curious, your uh, friend's husband, who yes, yes. was so successful in franchising, he didn't think that you should do a franchise. I, you know, he wasn't um, necessarily against doing a franchise, we actually looked at a couple of franchises. Um, but he said, you know, the, the, he thought the best thing about a franchise was if they had like some special sauce that no one else could recreate in terms of like, you know, what you end up paying in terms of like franchise fees and everything. If it's something you can go out and create your own, he thought, you know, do that. Or as, as we learned it, it seemed to be less risky. We we were always about like lowering risk. And just from everything I read, it seemed to be less risky buying um, a, an established company that was, you know, over a million dollars in revenue and mm -hmm. um, going from there. So he had a great experience, though, with franchises. Sounds like it. Great. Jana, tell us about your side of things. How I got here. So yeah. I have uh, worked in government and, and uh, nonprofits for most of my career. Um, I've essentially worked for the same leader for the last 20 years. He was the mayor of a major metropolitan city. Now he's the CEO of a foundation and I'm the chief of staff. Um, he is likely going to be retiring pretty soon. Um, and so it got me thinking about what I want to do next, where I can apply everything that I've learned in all these various positions um, and and was looking for some autonomy. And so when Julie and I, we were, I think we we're on vacation one, mm, yeah. one weekend. Up at a cabin. 
up at a cabin and we just started talking about, you know, what, what we want to do. Julie was already kind of looking at this, starting or buying a business. Um, and then we just continued the conversation and I, I kind of was like, well, that, that sounds great because I have all these skills that I've picked up over the last 20 years. You know, it, I have never worked directly in business. Um, and I'm going to need to find something. I don't want to stay where I'm at. And so if we can find something that over the next few years we can grow, um, and then I can step out of, of my nine to five, if you will. And so you had said that you and Julie, the kind of the, as the plan forms, you and Julie partner, but you don't immediately go in. You go in, I guess, when this gentleman retires. Right. Or when we reach, you know, a point that th that it makes sense financially. Well, obviously, the trust issue between partners is one that you got to leapfrog because as sisters, you have a lifetime of truff, trust built up. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, of course, partnering with so with a, a sister or a family member or a friend, et cetera, um, could only adds another layer of complexity to the the partnership relationship. How did you all think about the 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 potential downsides here, the risks here to the relationship? Yeah, we um we talked to a lot of people as we were sort of going through the process of like looking at businesses and deciding what we wanted to do. I have um, a really good friend who has a family business um, that's really successful and spent some time talking to her. Um, we talked to other folks who had family businesses and then we, we kind of formulated that, you know, we need a really good legal partnership agreement um, mm -hmm. that gives us, either one of us, a really easy out if we want to get out. You know, no questions asked. This is how we would divide it up. We spend a lot of time working on our relationship, I guess, and working, you know, uh, my mentor or our mentor, um, uh, Michael is his name, um, mm -hmm. said, you know, like over communicate with each other. Just make sure you communicate everything. And I think that has been really important. You know, every day I call Jana and give her like an update of what's going on and just just really making sure we're communicating everything. But, you know, we're, we're early and so far so good. You know, we're just very aware of the fact that it could be very difficult. Um, yeah. A and partnership I, like this. I think we went into it you know, knowing about that, thinking about it, talking about it, making sure that that was definitely something that we needed to um, be very intentional about. So let's hear about what your search parameters were. You've decided to partner. Now the search comes. What what were the parameters? What was the timeline? Share with us about that, please. I certainly didn't want to go back to school um, and, you know, learn something very like time consuming or, you know, so we wanted to look for something that was something we could learn how to do. First, we wanted to like start a business from scratch. We focused on like home service businesses also because we, um, through my friend, Michael, we had a lot of sort of connections in that world and that's what he did. And, um, so, you know, we, that's, sort of where we started. Um, we looked at, uh, you know, like I said, an, an epoxy flooring business, which was a franchise. Um, so that was the first perimeter though, I guess, was something we could do. Um, and so you we, two were prepared to do epoxy coating yourselves? You were prepared to be the technicians in whatever it was? I think we were we were prepared to learn how to do it in case we needed to. Like, I don't think we were going into it thinking that was going to be our role, but I think okay. we wanted to be able to step in if needed and to find something that that, yes, we could physically do um, if needed. But okay. yeah, like we when, when we were 
looking, we went to an epoxy flooring company um, in New York because of the weather conditions are similar to Minnesota. And, you know, we like checked to make sure we could even like lift some of the equipment, equipment which, you know, we had to like jump on it and get it down. And so, yeah, I mean, we, we wanted to make sure we could fill in. So you really were not scared of getting your hands dirty. It wasn't the game plan, but you'd do it if you had to. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. literally yeah. dirty. Literally, okay, yes. Literally. Yes. Yes. Um, and then I think the other parameter, you know, as, as, we, as we went into our search, we added more things. Like um, once we decided we wanted to buy a business, we wanted a million in revenue to start with. Mm -hmm. Um, and then what were some of the other things we, I think we're, our minimum SDE was like 300,000. Yeah. To start with is what we were looking for. Um, and let's talk about that number. So the idea there is, I assume you were going to use an SBA loan. Yes and do some sort of 10% or 20% down structure? Yes, yes, yep. Assuming that the the SBA loan payments are gonna eat up half your SDE, right? Let's call it. So yep. that if you bought a business with 300 SDE, once you got in it, that would leave 150 after loan payments. And so that 150 was gonna go to both of you, one of you, less than one of uh, you know one of you and then but not even full salary and the rest goes to reinvestment in the business it's a low sd what i'm getting at clearly yep. is that it's a yep. low sde number particularly with two partners right and, yeah. and mid mid career folks who you know right. who are you know can can make good income elsewhere so i think that we are lucky in the fact that i can continue with my regular job and i don't need to be paid uh julie you know currently her husband has a good job. Um, and I think we could be a little bit more lenient about how much we needed to make in the beginning of this venture, yep. Um, yep. knowing that we were hoping to build and scale and make the company more profitable. But I also, I did need to make a salary. Yes. So that was part of the, um, because, you know, I would be working full time in the business yeah. and leaving my job we had the benefit of my husband working, but I did need to earn something. Could you share um, with us like what you needed? Was this like 50 or 75 sort of thing you needed to be able to take out? Well, I think by the, by the time we got done, I, I, because we, I had been unemployed for about a year and a half at that point, um, closer to a hundred, like I would say our final SDE requirements were more in the, 450 500 range ah, um, precisely for yeah. this reason because yeah. because julie needed to make a yeah. proper salary after having gone unpaid for a year yes. and a half and again we learned that like that's one of the amazing things about like acquiring a business is we learned that you don't have to like give up absolutely everything to do this or we you say, know we didn't more. We grew up with parents who were not finance, financial people or, or, you know, entrepreneurs. And so we had, I had never learned how you can use money to make money. I had always thought you needed, um, you know, to come up with an idea and grit your way through to make money. You know, like you had to have this amazing idea and you had to like eat ramen noodles for four years and, you know. Well, you're you not, know, you're just not like, alone in thinking that, Julie. That's, right. that, that's part of the reason why this podcast exists, to disabuse yes. people of that notion. Go ahead. Yeah. And I mean, I wish I would have known this sooner because, I mean, I'm loving what I'm doing right now. It's totally up my alley. But it, it, it didn't take like a massive change in lifestyle. It definitely has changed, you know, like my husband is now the main parent for a while. And, you know, it changed a lot. But financially, it luckily, because my husband works, it it didn't 
cause as much deprivation as I yeah. thought it might. Yeah. But that that also is is a lesson in buying a slightly larger business because you right. your criteria of SDE expanded or grew to be 450 or 500 that was going to give you extra room to pay yourself. Yeah. So so that's also a key takeaway I think here. I mean right. if you're if you're going to buy a business with low SDE uh, and it, it which means it's going to be quite small and you're going to need to invest some of the earnings of the business back into the business so there's going to be even less SDE for you to pocket you very likely either need to do a ramen living yeah. lifestyle yeah. Right. or yeah. you need to have sources of income or big savings or whatever so I, this yep. is all kind of basic arithmetic but it's worth spelling yep. out for people yep great for sure and jenna going back to your um expected future involvement in the business you said it was going to be timed to your boss who you're for whom you're chief of staff retiring but it, i suspect it's also going to be tied now to the business generating enough earnings to pay you something yes. that would be acceptable. Yes. So there's actually two criteria yep. to meet before you get into the business. Yep. I'm pretty flexible in my career. Like I can continue as long as, you know, I, I need to until the business is profitable enough for me, me to, to start working um, mm -hmm. there. So I do have some flexibility, which I think is, is good. Do you have hopes? Is it kind of like a sooner the better or huh. are you like a year feels good or five years? Like, like I think I, I, assume, probably, I assume it's not completely open-ended. No, it, I'm thinking, you know, three years, three to five ah. years. Ah, okay. So a lot so, more longer term. So Julie will have been in the business running it for three to five years when you step in. Hey, I'm, I'm warning you now that could, that could be tricky for the yes. partnership. Yes. Yeah, Julie's going to feel like the boss or is going to be the boss. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I also like we have uh, larger aspirations, I guess, in okay. terms of like where we want to take this. And, you know, I could see a situation where I am the person who like, like eventually we'd like to get like a general manager to come in and mm -hmm. run and then go buy more businesses either in this um, you know, in woodworking or cabinets or something else. So I could see a scenario where Jana jumps, like I go and like start, you know, like jump in when we buy a new one and set up our systems, set up, um, you know, get things rolling for a year and a half, two years, and then you know, I move on to the next one and, and like, there's a, a place for Jana to like in the, in the overarching structure too. And I also am working in the business. Like I'm not like re removed from it. Mm -hmm. You know, I have duties that, that I'm doing in the business and I'm here a lot. Okay. Well, that's a good clarification because with a full-time job, one might think that you are pretty, it's pretty removed. Um, so, so the vision, uh, recognizing that you're only, you said October, so yeah. only nine months into it, we're going to see how it goes, but the vision, uh, that could come to pass is kind of a hold code. You bought, bought multiple businesses and you're kind of the, you're kind of the one who jumps in as the immediate manager operator, uh, Julie, and mm -mm. for a time gets things transitioned. And then maybe rinse and repeat. And Jana, you might be kind of more at the hold co level. And maybe I'm already like layering on more detail that, you know, maybe from your all's perspective, it's like, well, we'll, we'll just cross that bridge when we get there. But um, it feels like that's kind of what you said. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, that's my vision. Um, we are a ways away from that, of course. Sure. But sure. Uh, yeah. That, and that's... Jenna, do you imagine yourself ever being an operator, getting in? Um, I got you know I I haven't like put too terribly much thought into that. I think like right. That's a no. That's a no. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Go ahead. 
<laughs> it's definitely something that I need to think about and we need to plan for of yeah, like what's going to sure. happen next when this sure. eventually yeah. happens. Tell us some of the listings that you looked at or the businesses that you that you considered before arriving at um, what you did. So the first one we looked at, which was, I think it was like $225,000 was the asking price, was like a fabric Whoa. curtain upholstery. That was the first one we we looked at, um, kind of like our a practice, I guess, type interview the owner, see how this all goes. Um, so that was so the first one. So 225 was the was the purchase price. Was you the weren't even seriously price. considering it. The SDE no. on that would have been right. 50 grand. Yeah, right. right. Okay. Yes. Just kind of like if, dip our toes in and and see how this whole um buying a business process works, I guess. Mhm. Mm okay. What else? Uh so then we looked at um I you know, I think the epoxy flooring was next which was the franchise, um, we ran into this issue with the brokers um, who were selling the upholstery thing. That we, just had, we just had a bad experience with them. So we were like, okay, we need to pause. And we, um, I just like put in an email request to this franchise and started working directly with them. Um, we were pretty serious about that one. We actually traveled to multiple sites. We were in Salt Lake City and uh, New York um, to look at different franchise sites. Um, and then, at, and then at the end of the day, we just we just couldn't pull the trigger on it. Um, we looked at another epoxy flooring company that was trying to sort of do s something similar to a franchise. Um, but he was just kind of starting out. Okay. We looked at, let's see, after that, we looked at an asphalt company. We looked at two asphalt companies. Um, one was actually uh, owned by a woman. And so we were um, pretty excited about that one. Then we went to an asphalt convention <laughs> and we're, uh, <laughs> we're, uh, gotta, had some gotta interesting, love, gotta love small business. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Had some interesting interactions and came away. What, what, do you mean? what do you mean? Well, so we met with, um, it just turned out that my sister or my daughter's riding instructor's husband's dad <laughs> yeah <laughs> was like this asphalt king and had just okay. sold his gigantic asphalt business to private equity and it turned out he was going to be at the convention so we met with him one morning <laughs> and he was like I don't know why you guys want to want to be in this business. And he, I mean, I think he clearly like had had a rough night of celebrating. So like he was, <laughs> I was like, do not do it. Yeah, he's like, you do don't not do it. Do it. Everybody is like why? an asshole. Why? And oh. I think I think well, it was. But, uh, t tell us, it sounds funny and interesting. But also, there are going to be people listening to this who are looking at asphalt companies. So, right. so yes. right. why, yeah. why did the king of asphalt say don't get in? Especially since he'd sold and, you know, pro probably was speaking pretty candidly. Yeah, I think because it, he said it's a really, I think, like, it's a really tough business. And he had started when he, he like, went to a year of college, quit college, was like, I want to, I want to do my own thing. And he started at the very, like he started with a pickup truck and a shovel and asphalt. So, you know, he started at the very beginning um, and had been in it for, you know, 30 plus years. Um, I think he thought it was like physically demanding. Um, I think he thought it was uh, just really difficult to, and this is funny given what we now own, 
but difficult to deal with contractors, construction, you know, different construction projects. Um, I think he thought it would be difficult for a woman to be in a, a business with that's pretty much male dominated. Um, but, yeah, now, did he say that or did you, are you assuming he thinks that? Uh, I am assuming I'm actually I think pretty he sure said, he said that. Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, he wasn't the only asphalt person who told us that too. Um, which, you know, I don't really put a lot of, you know, there, there was like a woman of asphalt booth that we hung out at and they were all like, yeah, do it. But, uh, so who knows about, you know, whether it's a woman, like, I'm sure there are tons of women who can go and rock it. I think he was also worried that we just didn't have the experience. Yeah. I think now would be the time to introduce that, that theme of your story as women looking at construction-y, home services-y, trades-y, blue-collar-y businesses, and um, what you experienced there. This is a, a theme of the story, um, so it'll we'll kind of interlace it throughout from here on out. Mm -hmm. But I don't think you were talking about the king of asphalt, but you looked at an asphalt company, a different asphalt company. This was the the owner who freaked out on you, right? Yes. Yes. Can can we hear that one? Because this one this one is directly related to again yeah. this theme. Yeah. yeah. What happened so, there? So so this was the second asphalt company we looked at. And and one of the reasons we were interested in asphalt and construction is because we have a background working in government and we were going to be certified as a woman owned business. And so we were going to try to take advantage of that, giving getting like government contracts and, you know, city municipality contracts. So that's sort of why asphalt kind of fit into what we were looking at. Um, but so we were met with the second asphalt company. He, um, you know, we like, we got the deal, I guess. Um, he, we met with him a couple times leading up to, uh, you know, signing. Um, we had our financing in place. We had agreed to keep his son on, which was really important to him to work in the business. Um, and we needed his son because his son, you know, really knew how to run the business and knew the, knew the business. Um, he was going to stay on for like a year and help us. Um, we were going to pay him for, uh, he was going to do it, I think for free the first month. And then we were going to pay him as a consultant. Well, like literally we were hammering out the agreement and the night before we were supposed to meet with our lawyers to finalize, he called me at about eight o'clock at night and he was like, I can't do this. I can't sell this to you. Um, you guys don't, you know, you're, you're not going to know what you're doing. This is a rough business. Um, he was just like, Complete 180 because he had mm. been really supportive at first. And um, so this I, was completely just, out of the blue. Yes. You're at the finish line and he yeah. calls you and starts ranting. Yes. And he was, he was, he was ranting. And, and was it about your lack of experience or the fact that you were women both? Was he explicit? He wasn't explicit, and this has been sort of something that, uh, like, uh, something we have not been able to figure out, but it's been a common theme in everything from meeting with banks to, you know, buying businesses. Is it our lack of experience or is it because we're women? Is it because we don't have business experience? Like, we haven't been able to really parse out what yeah. it is you know, which one of those, and it could be a combination of all of them, um, you know, that's given people pause uh, yeah. when, when like presenting them with, with us. Um, and do yeah. you feel like you, do you feel like you've gotten a lot of no's or pauses 
compared to you listen to Acquiring Minds? So compared to <laughs> the sense you get from other guests? I think so. I mean, it definitely, and and from other business owners that I talk to, mm-hmm. um, it definitely seems that, again, you can't parse out what it is if it's women, lack of business experience or lack of like industry experience, what it is. But, you know, I think it definitely uh, seems that it's happened more to us than other people. Other people may have gotten no's for other things, but I have never heard somebody get a no for lack of experience. In my limited network of people who buy small, you know, mid-sized businesses. Yeah. Jana, what do you think? Um, I guess I agree with Julie. I feel like we were second in a lot of the the businesses we went after. Um, but I feel like we we went after quite a few before we we found one that was a good fit for us. Um, and I think it's a combina- I also think it's a combination of factors. I think that being two women does play a role in it when you're looking at construction um depending on the owners right like like the the folks we bought this business from they had no qualms at all about us being two women in mm-hmm. the business um but i feel like kind of like maybe generationally there are some still still mm-hmm. some things about women being in in um the construction industry or labor that that pops up once in a while. You know, it's one of the th- things not to excuse the behavior of some of these sellers, but it might not be that they are like, I don't think you can do it because you're women, but they think that their own crews Mm -hmm. might Mm -hmm. yeah so they're they're kind of you know they're kind of projecting on to you know onto their crews how their crews might react to you Mm -hmm. yep um and go ahead no no basically that's it go ahead i think i think that's a really important point because you know the crews and then also like the contractors you're working with right um so yeah, so which is again not to excuse it or to say that it's it still fundamentally comes down to more friction as women. Um, so, but it, it it could be them imagining kind of second order right uh, experiences that you'd have. Very interesting. Um, well, it's good for other women to hear, and and it's this thing that happens so much in kind of um, you know social dynamics. Um, with you know gender and race and so on is you if i went through those experiences that maybe i would have gotten the same amount of nose the same you know mm-hmm. I felt this, but i wouldn't have had to ha- have the nagging um right. mm-hmm. question mark mm-hmm. in my mind mm-hmm. so even if i went through the same exact process the same exact experiences and number of noses you did i still am going through it a little more lightly because i don't have to th- i wonder Hmm. Is it because I'm a, a woman sort of thing? So anyway, mm-hmm, something right. for everybody out there to be aware of, but particularly female listeners, although they mm-hmm. probably could have guessed that this would be something they'd have to, an, an additional level that they'd have to deal with. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Well, um, let, let's, we're quite a few minutes in. We haven't heard about the business you bought. So let's, let's get to that. Tell us about the, the business that you bought, what it is and why did you like it? All right. Well, um, we bought a um, commercial cabinet company. Um, we do it's it's custom work. We do uh, tenant improvement jobs for like office spaces. We do um, medical offices, retail, restaurants, bars, um, work. Through, we're a subcontractor, so we work through contractors uh, for the most part. Um, and Cab- we making cabinets, and, and so cabinets yep. are specialized enough. I mean, I know that putting up, you know, IKEA cabinets in a kitchen is hard. I'm just thinking in a residential con- uh, c- uh, context. 
here that the general contractor that does the rest of the kitchen is also doing your cabinets. It's not a specialty thing. Um, but in a bar or a dental office or a com any commercial environment, cabinets are a specialty thing. So the GC that's handing, handling all the other construction activity just doesn't knock it out themselves. Yeah. And even in residential, they, they don't. They're like residential cabinet companies too that bid for, yeah. But um, yeah, they, the, so like the architect will work with the contractor to um, come up with, you know, everything. And then they'll bid out the cabinets and the millwork. So, you know, we do like closets, we do cabinets, we do reception desks. Um, those are our main things. We're doing a lot of feature walls right now. Mm. Um, so like wood paneling or um, slat walls. Any mm -hmm. any sort of um, mill work that is in an office space. Okay, and so that's why this mill work. That's why the it's kind of you call it woodworking. It's a woodworking yeah. business. Mm -hmm. When we bought it, it was I think so two point one in revenue last year in twenty well in twenty twenty two. So and we bought it October of twenty three three. Yeah. Um, they had seven employees. SDE was uh, seven fifty. Um, let's see. the The owner it had been in business for thirty years. Um, he was a cabinet maker himself and just grew the business. His wife did all the bookkeeping and accounting. She had like a full time job and did that on the side. We met with them um, and just connected with them right away. We really like the owners. We really think they, um, I mean, the business was just very well run. The guys had been here for, so there were seven employees. Three of them had been here for two for 20 years and one for like since it, it was started like 30 years, and the rest of them had been there for a couple of years. Um, and they, he, the owner thought that they would all stay on, which was really important to us because we know, knew nothing about cabinet making. Um, and, and by the way, this is also a trade that you're not going to be able to get in and do. Yeah. It's too I technical. I know, right? Yes. That, you know, <laughs> we, um, we, we just, we learned also that you can't be too rigid in your, your you know, it checked off other boxes. Um, so, and it was two years into it and we were like, we got to pull the trigger at some point and this feels right. Julie, uh, you've been searching for two years, like full time? Uh, I, it wasn't full time because I, I worked, but yeah, after COVID, I kind of left work. So, yeah. I mean, okay. it was yeah. two years yep. mm -hmm. and doing a ton of research and, um, you know, visiting, doing tons of networking. And the this business did the, of course, construction, construction related. That is always um, you are you're worried about the cyclicality of that. Lenders mm -hmm. don't always love it. How do you think about the project based? How do you how do you think about that? I guess 30 um, years old, that's the answer yeah, to that question. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> that, that meant a lot to us, that it was 30 years old, and he could have grown, but he didn't want to. Like, there's zero marketing budget, zero. Mm -hmm. And he was turning people away. And he just didn't want to manage more than seven people. Mm -hmm. But that really meant a lot to us, that, you know, like, it's, even though it's um, a construction business and cyclical, if you think about it, like every 10 years, people need new cabinets um, in like this, this space. It's kind of very niche, um, but they need to, a, a lease in an office space is basically every five or 10 years. And when mm -hmm. somebody moves out or moves in, they redo all the cabinets. Okay. Um, I didn't so realize it, that. Yeah. For the most part, I mean, 
sometimes it's not a big job. It's like, we want to change the break room cabinets or we, you know, but they always try to spruce it up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And with uh, like COVID, all these businesses are downsizing, which means they need to do tenant improvements and change, um, change their space, which was something short term to look at. But we didn't know that when we got into it. I don't think I didn't know that. Like that was a a blessing. Well, and wait, that that's a a blessing. Wait, yeah. but I'm, I I think of po the post COVID commercial world as smaller footprints, less office space. Yeah, we were worried about. So not a good thing. We were worried about it, um, and also worried about the economy because at the time we were buying, interest rates were rising. Yep. Um, and you know, people were predicting a recession and, uh, but yes, so we, we had these theoretical ideas about COVID and if his growth had been like COVID effect, but yeah, like what Jana said, we found out that all these bigger spaces were condensing because of work from home. And so there was tons of TI work going on because they had to make these spaces enticing for people. Like we put in kegerators and we're still putting in like <laughs> kegerators and like, you know, <laughs> just really um, thinking like, what do they call them? Thought rooms or. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> like, you know, just like all this updated stuff to get people to want to come back to the office. Okay, um, so so the fact that on the one hand it doesn't look good because the footprint of office is is going to just get smaller in the aggregate, but on the other hand, there's all this churn happening, which you do benefit from yeah. because they're re envisioning the office, the office, and therefore yeah. doing construction to put in mm -hmm. kegerators. Um, so lots of lots of work for you all. Um, okay, it, very interesting. I just want to say this. Um, I was yeah. talking to somebody a couple of days ago and he funds private equity funds who are solely interested in commercial real estate. Mm -hmm. And he was telling me that it's horrible for commercial real estate right now. Yeah. And to me, you know, a year ago, I would have been like, oh, that's that's must mean it's terrible for the cabinet business. And I think just a really interesting lesson in all of this is like to really get down to the local level and see what's actually happening because all these big numbers can can be very helpful in guiding you. But, you know, we're so busy we can't and and I don't I still don't know if there's like a delayed effect and it'll right. it'll hit us. But right. it's just so interesting to me that, you know, he's saying it's only starting to pick up now. Um, so I don't know. It's just really interesting to, you know, you, you just really got to talk to people. It's a great point, Julie. The, you know, we, we probably a lot of the associations we make about how what market a business is tied to are pretty loose. And they, and they they need to be interrogated more closely by mm -hmm. us as business buyers to really understand the dynamics there. Um, so it's a a great point. Um, but speaking of then a business owner, the seller who is turning business away, didn't want to grow, and what you're seeing, you're going gangbusters. So what what is revenue projected to be? You said it was two point one at the end of twenty for calendar year twenty two. Mm -hmm. You bought it late 23. What do you think revenue is on track to do for this year? We're on speaking on July 1st, so we're halfway through the year. Yeah, so we're at 1.5 now, almost 1.6. We have to Great. close things out, but um, for the end of the quarter. Um, you know, and summer is the slow season, theoretically, and we are booked through September. So... Ah. Yeah. So So you, you know, could see getting to three to three, I, like doubling. Yeah. Yeah. I I've sort of quietly made it our goal is to get to three. Okay. I also like 
the the guys um i don't want to scare people into like we're gonna throw all this work at you because we're new and we have all these goals and so that's what i mean by quietly but they they already have experienced a 50 percent increase in volume for the first six months of this year have you hired or are they just working harder or or what i mean they're already the business is working at a much higher level or there's more much more throughput 50 percent more throughput yeah so we um we've hired we hired uh two two new people and then like a summer intern um or a, a summer like a kid out of college who wants to see if he wants to be in the trade Mm -hmm. Um, but we're, and we're still trying to hire. It's been really tough to, to hire. I mean, that is what's going to slow us down. Mm -hmm. Yep. Not an uncommon thing to hear. Um, but with this, whatever intern apprentice guy testing things out, and then the two others that supports 50% growth in revenue from two one point one to 3 million. I also think that um, we've done some efficiencies in the shop Julie has and in kind of the project management of, mm -hmm. of the whole, um, operation. Um, I think that has helped keep the guys and actually we have a, a woman now cabinet maker. Um, yeah, so I shouldn't just say yeah, the guys. Yeah, I can't say the guys anymore. Mm. Um, have have like kind of uh, the the old owners did everything on like paper and pencil like they had mm -hmm. no technology like no systems in place for you know project management or anything like that so i think just kind of implementing some of those efficiencies has helped as well to produce sure. more so have you have you digitized the business we are working on it. It okay. is um it's a work in progress. You know, we have some, but we're still kind of figuring out what exactly we need for others, like job costing, um, figuring out what tools there are that can help with that. Um, so kind of narrowing g down. Give me one example of an efficiency that you thought was, you know, a big win. I would say even like just a minor thing is like paying bills online and mm -hmm. you know just like just like minor things yeah, yeah direct deposit for our employees um we have a a a a time clock system that we have implemented <laughs> i mean it's some mm -hmm. very simple things um but i think it it just it you know building on that is going to to be beneficial i feel like things are going really well i uh, have there been fetal moments have there been has there been any difficulty or i mean this is you're certainly making it sound too easy oh yeah no <laughs> there every day i mean so i'm trying to remember when the first fetal moment happened Oh, there I have mean, been multiple. We, okay. There have been multiple, yes. Um, we've had, you know, like our laminator uh, a couple weeks ago got Guillain-Barre syndrome and had to go to the hospital, you know, and is paraly was paralyzed and now is having to work through getting, ba you know, getting back to work. But no. because we have such a small team, you know, we – lost a li the laminator which is like an important job um luckily one of the new hires knew how to do that so we've had like some just employee like tragedies like that happen um the cash flow situation is is real it's <laughs> real it is um we we could not understand it when the previous owner kept saying we can't explain to you cash flow because it is so dependent on when the they don't pay you until the entire job is done and then the contractor gets paid. So we have jobs that we haven't yet been paid for and they've been done and you know we've paid for all the materials for like 4 to 6 months. Yes. So 
cash flow was rough. Yeah, that I think is definitely That's, something. Yeah, that we knew it was going to be a problem, but we didn't realize how big of a an issue not issue but how big of a how much we we're gonna have to like manage it every single day to make sure that we had enough cash and that it was longer we had right. like we had figured out like three to four months is what we needed for cash flow and it's i mean like i said some jobs it, it can be up to six months to get paid and how have you managed other than being super on top of it have you had to use a line of credit or infuse the business with more of your own cash or anything like that? Or just hyper discipline has got you through? I think that, so we had a working line of credit as part of our financial package. So we have used that and we're using that. Um, that has been able to sustain us for now. Okay. Um, and hopefully, you know, it, it seems like we're getting a handle on it as as we get more of yeah. these like lagging receivables in. <laughs> but yeah. um, and I, I think relationships also mattered a lot because we had a great relationship with the bank. So they increased our line of credit like three months in when they could see that we were, you know, selling going to have some trouble. Yeah, and they could see all the the, the sales on the books. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, we, like, if something, like, one month I talked to our landlord and I said, can you wait a week to cash our rent check? You know, and we have a great relationship with him. He actually owns, I mean, he owns the building, but he owns the company that's on the, like, other side of our building. Um you know, sometimes we can call our uh, vendors and like we've just through talking to people and like we have a, our, our quartz guy. He's like, I totally understand. I own my own business. I went through it like, yes, you can pay me next week. Totally fine. Like we are just honest. Yeah. And, you know, and so far people have been great. Like I'm sure they won't. Wouldn't want that to go on, but you know, we don't want it to go on forever. And it's like Jana said, it's it's evening out now where it's not as big of a problem. You're basically having to wait twice. The general contractor's got to get paid and then you got to get paid from the general contractor. So your business model is the GCs, you're a sub to general contractors. So so let's, let's talk a little bit about that um, because that's one of the cons. Oh, I would say one of the benefits of the model, well, I don't know if this is a benefit, but one of the things with this model is that we don't work directly with customers, mm, which yeah. I think is nice. We work with this, the contractors who have a better understanding of the business and like how it works. And, you know, you're not talking to somebody who just had their kitchen cabinets put in and are super mad about it or yeah. didn't like the work you did. Um we're, we're working with, with contractors rather than customers. I guess the contractors are customers. Yeah. But, and also the commercial side of it is right. rather than doing residential, I think is, is great in terms of, yeah, customer feedback. And the, is there customer concentration when you're working for GCs? Is it like, you know, some big GC in town? You guys are in Minneapolis. Yep. Some big GC in town provides you all your work sort of thing. I'm exaggerating, but something like that. What's constant customer no, concentration like when was, you're a sub? That was another huge red flag in the business. Um, we have basically two contractors and we work in like with smaller contractors. I would say they're mid-sized contractors. Um, eventually we want to, reach out to the larger contractors but right now we're just bidding job to kind of medium-sized contractors maybe 50 to 60 percent of our jobs are with these two contractors wow yeah which is huge red flag um i am one of the things i'm doing is working on trying to diversify that um 
pool because there's plenty out there. Uh, it's just, again, a matter of like, we don't want to, they really count on us. So we don't want to stop delivering to them. We just want to add on. And again, right. that's, that's a growth, uh, a growth strategy and still working on hiring people. Right. Right. Again, that being the bottleneck. I mean, yeah. if you could hire people, you could probably pretty easily find more GCs to work with who themselves yeah, yeah. are probably, probably desperate for no work, no workers, yeah. cabinet makers. Talk about to us about the experience of buying into a business where you don't know anything. It's, and it's a, as you, as you said, Julie, this is a pretty, this is a skilled trade. This is a, this is something people go to school for. Uh, and here you guys are sauntering off the street to buy the business. What can you tell people who are, haven't yet gone down this path about how to prepare for it? Um, I would say the owner was key in um, how, like, in training me in, and I still have breakfast with him every couple weeks. Um, he really, I, I mean, he believed in us. He knew that I, he's, he's like, you're not going to learn how to build cabinets, but you're going to learn how to bid them and understand how they're made and understand like the process. You know, actually building them is something that you don't even really need to know. But so he really spent a lot of time teaching me. He also spent a lot of time when they announced the sale, there were three guys who were pretty upset about it. Um, oh. The three who had been here for a long time. And the owner spent a couple weeks taking them out to lunch, you know, um, really talking to them to get them on board. And without those three guys staying, and they have taught me so much, um, it would have been really tough. I don't, I don't think I could have done it without the owner being heavily involved and the three main guys being, I mean, they, they changed their attitudes. They are so helpful. Um, they are like a couple of days ago, one of them brought me a cabinet making book. And, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if that's a hint, but also <laughs> like he, he, he's always, you know, they're just always they're great. really, yeah, which we couldn't have done it without them. And how do you think they were, they were won over? Was it the seller, the seller is taking them to lunch and, and convincing them? Or it's something that you've done now as their new bosses and owners? I think that it's a combination, but I think that Julie has built really strong relationships with them and has listened, like spent a lot of time talking to them and listening to them. And, you know, low hanging fruit, like direct deposit, you know, just doing some of those things right away um, that they had been wanting is is helpful in, in building the team and getting everybody on board. But Julie spent a lot of time with Yeah. Them. And we really focused, and this is something we believe too. Like, uh, like we, you know, the first couple of weeks, I'm just like, I want to listen. I want to, you know, you guys know, we know nothing about, we are honest. We don't know anything yeah. about cabinets. I want to listen. I want you guys to tell me what's working, what's not working. I also want us to grow together and we want to share that. Like we want to share our success with all of you. And, you know, when we get to that point, we will figure out a way for you all to like share this because there is no way we could have done this without every single one of them buying into us and you know, working with us and doing their jobs and like they're rocking it. Well, good for you, Julie, for, I mean, there's, <laughs> uh, really, I mean, you seem to I mean, have it wasn't, it, not without like, well. not without, uh, you know, issues along the way. <laughs> but I think the one thing I really worked on with them is like, uh, just, to be open and honest, like, tell me what I'm doing wrong. It's fine. 
I'm and not how often be. do they how often do they come to you and tell you you're doing something wrong? And what what for example? Quite often. Quite <laughs> 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 what have they told you? Uh, just like the other day, I was uh, bidding a project, and um, I it was a bigger project with a lot of like wood details and feature walls and fancy reception desks, and I emailed like our main my main uh, estimator and project manager, and I'm like, can I can because he was also bidding on the job for another contractor, and I was like can you just check my bid to make sure it's okay? And he was like, no offense. This job is too big for you. Sorry. <laughs> but, oh. but yes, I, I will uh, bid it and we can go over it on Monday and I can show you like, you know, so they, they tell me, you know, but I, that's how we learn. Right. And I tell them like every mistake you make, they were a little bit, hesitant to they kind of like covered up mistakes and and I'm like every mistake you make is an opportunity to make things better so let's talk about it mm -hmm. um and so we're starting to get out of that that shell of like yeah. hiding things but anyways yes they're very honest <laughs> <laughs> which is good I have a strong Yes. Self esteem, yes. so I can handle it. <laughs> and I know I know nothing about cabinets. So, well, I want to start wrapping this up, but I, I there was um, an in the weeds question that I, I failed to get to that I think is important. Just the the structure of the deal. So, so I don't think we heard about that reminder to people. It was the business when you were bidding to buy it was two point one million dollars in revenue in seven hundred and fifty in SDE, which by the way. Great margins. Those are thirty three percent margins in a subcontracting construction business. Yeah. That, so I should I be surprised because I am. Those seem like really good margins. I was crazy surprised. I mean, it it's. I think it's just it's a really complicated business. So okay. maybe uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's. Um, but does it fit, now that you've been in it for for nine months? Do you feel like those margins are true to your experience? Um, we, so the previous owner like pinched every single penny to get okay. to that. We are doing some improvements, so we're spending more. Right. right. I can see down the road us getting back to that. But, yeah. you know, like we just spent some money on doing a, a shop clean out because he like kept everything. So, you know, we got a dumpster. We actually had three dumpsters that we, you know, so we're spending some more, more than he spent. But yeah. I think it will even out once we, you know, get things implemented and yeah. Right. These are these are one time expenses. And so you think you could return to a 33 percent margin uh, status quo? Yeah, we'll see. I mean, we also... Also, want. he wasn't investing in marketing. You'll you'll want no. to do that on an ongoing basis. Yeah. Yep. And he wasn't investing in growth and hiring, et cetera, et cetera. So right. these are all, if, if you're growth oriented, are going to be ongoing new expenses. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that might just be one of those where we, that we often hear about if SDE seems really high and or margins seem really high, it could be because the business is just being underinvested in, very common yep. for a, yep. a, mm -hmm. a retiring owner to just be underinvesting, and or that the the team is underinvested in, like he's doing too much that he should have a, yeah. you know, he's doing the work of two employees. There should be another employee there, something like that. Well, and um, just two mm -hmm. points on that: the yeah. um, what the one thing we found out that we should have probably looked into, a, you know, note to sell for the next time. The employees hadn't had a raise in forever, like pre-COVID. So we yep. had to get their salaries straightened out um, yep. or their wages. And then the other thing was he really like our mentor, Michael, said, go through the P&L and like you can eliminate, you know, probably there's so much junk in there that you can get rid of. And there was not a thing. <laughs> Like it was, <laughs> it was bare bones. It was bare bones. Like, yeah. 
No, you know, wow. nothing. So he really didn't spend much. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So it was 750 SDE. What did you buy it for? What did the structure of the deal look like, please? So uh, we bought it for 2.1, We're right? Or two? Two. Two. And then we put 10% down. We had a seller's note for 10% and then an SBA financing for the rest. Okay. Very classic. Pretty yep. straightforward. Yep. And yep. that 10% you put down, you guys split? The two of yep. you? Yep. Okay. Easy enough. And then as part of that deal, we had the line of credit in there as well. Yeah, that was part of it. it how, was, and how much, what, how much was the Was credit? it 350 to start with? No, I think it was 250 to start with. Oh, okay. What about the fact that this is both of your first business experience? Like your business people for the first time. How's that going? Yeah. I think it's a bit of an adjustment for me because, um, you know, I've, I'm, I've always been working for, I don't know what, taxpayers or community. And, and this is like, I have to think about this as my business that I need to like continue to be super motivated to meet goals. It's not just going to, you know, not just going to build itself. Um, mm -hmm. so I think that's been a bit of an adjustment for me. And is this a, do you like this or do you not like this? I do like this. I do like this. I mean, Jenna, often one of the things you'll hear guests say is that they wanted to build something for themselves as opposed to building. Right. Serving somebody else's. Right. Building for somebody else, essentially. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Julie, uh, so you, you're taking to being a business person. It, it feels pretty natural. The, the, so going from public health to being in business. Yeah, I think it's a little bit like my campaign background because it's it's very similar to running a, a political campaign in terms of like having to budget and having to, you know, get things done and figuring out how to do things and networking. And um, but I also love the fact that I'm doing this for myself. Because I also have never worked for myself. I always worked, you know, public health is for the public good. And campaigns are for, you know, getting somebody elected. And I just, like, I love that, you know, that I'm, like, this is about, like, what I'm building and growing. And I love the challenge of it. And um, I love that you have to be really scrappy to figure things out. Um, or at least I do maybe because I didn't go to, you know, business school. Like I just, you just got to solve problems. And I love mm -hmm. that. And just to wrap up on the, the theme of women, because I hear from women and they want to have more, see more women where you all are sitting here as guests on the pod, hear more stories from women. Um, we've already talked about it quite a bit, but is there anything more that you want to speak to them to say? I, I will say that this seems like a very encouraging story, but what, what would you say? So I would say that one thing, like advice, if I could give advice, yeah, is of course. for other women, is to just network with a lot of other female business owners and a lot of women who are working like maybe not in the industry because we kind of had a hard time finding that for some of these, but just like a lot of networking, a lot of meeting with women who may be in the same situation. Okay. Yeah. And I, I mean, I would also just say, you know, I mean, be fearless, like don't let perceptions or uh, get in your way. It's been a, a great experience for us. And it's, it's sort of fun being in a business where we're, you know, kind of the minority um, mm -hmm. because everything looks like an opportunity for us. I, what do you mean? Well, like, so we, we just hired um, a young woman cabinet maker and I have this big giant box truck that we use to deliver our, our cabinet, like for big jobs. And the laminator had the license to drive the box truck and he's out. And so I needed to get another employee 
to go get the license requirement and drive the truck to these big jobs. My two young guy guys said they didn't want to drive it. And I, because for whatever reasons, and I was like, I will ask Darcy because she will jump at the chance to do something new and, you know, powerful. And, and I knew it. She was Ah. like, yes, I will do it. Of course I will like sign me up, you know, because there, there's just so many new opportunities for women that it's, it's really exciting. So yeah. a lot of the stuff that happens in the business is not traditionally done by women. So women could really enjoy kind of probably haven't had the experiences yeah. themselves. Yeah. And so yeah. there's a lot of opportunity for new experiences. Yeah. 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 Okay. Better way to say it. And and all of uh, all of that, what we were talking about earlier, where sellers either themselves thought as two women, it wouldn't work or thought that their employees wouldn't give you the respect that you'd need to be successful bosses, all of that stuff. Now that you're on the other side of your transaction in, in a business, you're, you know, you're, you're just a data point of one, the one business that you bought. But do you have any more insight into that now? Do you think that, um, sounds like things are going well with your own business, but do you understand it better? Do you, uh, have you learned anything about all these sellers' perspectives on the fact that you were women and what on the inside, what it's actually like to be in one of these businesses? Um, were they they were just wrong (laughs) yeah they were just you know i don't know i think i think maybe not having a business background is probably the biggest red flag to people yeah um i think the contractors that we've worked with they have had no issues no uh, no i mean it's been surprising actually that the contractors are like, we just want our cabinets. We don't care. You know, yeah. we want to make sure <laughs> that you know what you're doing, but we don't care what gender you are. Or, you know, they just want to do business. So that's been refreshing and great. Okay. Well, let's end it there. Julie and Jana Hottinger, how can people reach out to you? Uh, email is the best. Um, okay. We'll and, put that out. I'll, I'll get those okay. from you. Put those in the, in the show notes. Okay. Uh, and what is the name of the business? Signature Woodworking. Okay. And we'll we don't find... have a website. We have not. <laughs> ah, wow. That guy We're really working wasn't, on that. That guy really wasn't spending money on marketing. Nope. Oh, no. It? Nope. Nah. <laughs> not a... Okay. Okay. Julie and Jenna, thank you very much for sharing. A really fascinating right. story. Congratulations on the early success. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that interview. Make sure you subscribe to the Acquiring Minds channel below. We are now publishing twice a week. So tons of new interviews and stories to come. Stories that will help you along your own path to acquiring a business.